Hey guys, it's Ty the Dog Guy, and I want to welcome you here to our Transform Your Dog in 60 Days DVD. Uh, I'm really thrilled you're here because over the next uh, 60 to 80 minutes, or however long it takes me to get through this material here, over the next little bit, I can guarantee you you're going to learn a lot about your dog and a lot about what you can start doing over the next 60 days to start seeing some huge results with your dog. And so what I want to do is I want to invite you, if you need to pause this or whatever, go get some notes, go get you know, a piece of paper, pen, something like that so you can take some notes. Because like I say, the next 60 to 80 minutes is going to have a ton of content, a ton of information for you uh, and, and, and really help you out quite a bit. Now, uh, I don't know how you got this DVD. Uh, you might have got it from your vet. Um, you might have got it online. Some people watching this DVD are going to be here in our state of Utah. Uh, and then we have clients all over the world, you know, uh, literally Europe, Africa, Asia, uh, South America, all over the world, all of the United States. So, so in any case, wherever you are watching this, I want to congratulate you because so many people have big goals for their dog. So many people have big desires for their dog but they never do anything with it, right? You know, they never push forward and they never try to improve things for their dog. And so just the fact that you're sitting down watching this is gonna be great. So, um, so again, now my, my plan is, my hope is that over the next 60 to 80 minutes, you're gonna have a ton of information, a ton of things that you can do. And for a lot of folks, that's gonna be plenty. They're gonna go off and they're gonna work with their dog and be in great shape. Now, some folks are gonna want more. And so depending on whether you're in Utah, or depending on you know whether you're outside of Utah, we do have different training programs. And so over the next minute or so, through the magic of television, I'm going to put some links down below um, so that if you are in Utah and you want to figure out how to work with us some more, you can do that. Or if you're outside of Utah, you know you can look at the links down there and figure out uh, ways that you can work with us outside of Utah. So in so any case, I would encourage you to write down those links or whatnot, and then check them out and see if we can help you out some more. But what I want to do, like I said, is give you a ton of great information so that you can start making some changes in your dog today. Now, we, what I'm talking about today is Transform Your Dog in 60 Days. It's, uh, it's a really great program. I know I'm the guy that, uh, that sells this program, and so it's easy for me to say how great this program is. But the reality is I've been in dog training since 1994, um, and I've worked for people. I've worked for myself. I've owned my own company. I've worked for other businesses. Um, I've been to seminars, I've been around other trainers, um, and what we're doing now, I'm seeing a level of results that I just haven't seen before, especially in such a compressed time. Because what we've done is we've taken everything that we've seen work over the years, um, and we've tweaked it, played with it, and we've what's spit out on the other end is a system that just works. Now, it works for, gosh, just about every, you know, anything that you can imagine. We've had dogs that had big bite histories, bitten people, bitten dogs, that have become social and friendly. Uh, we've had dogs that were reactive and, and barking and lunging at everybody that became friendly. We've had dogs that were being destructive, dogs that were going to the bathroom in the house, dogs that were jumping on people, dogs that were pulling on the leash, wouldn't come with call. You know, just about anything that you can think of, we've had dogs go through that program, um, you know, through this program, and, and we've been able to fix it. Um, and, and what I want to start out with is in talking about what I call my dog training baseline. So I'm gonna throw down some theory for you right now, throw down some, you know, the, the concepts behind this program. Uh, I'm gonna show you, you know, we've got a demo dog here today that we're gonna work with. Um, and so today's gonna to be kind of a mix of teaching you concepts, showing you things with the dog, talking about the equipment that we use, things like that. And so, but like I say, everything that we do hinges on working on what we call a dog training baseline. So let's say that we were to create, you know, draw a baseline right here. On one end, we've got complete chaos. Now, from complete chaos, we get behaviors like aggression, anxiety, destruction. You know, a lot of the bad behaviors uh, that we see in our dogs come from what we would term a chaotic mindset. Now chaos, like I say, isn't like a dog that's always just running in circles necessarily, but it's a dog that when he's presented with something that's confusing, stressful, whatever, different, exciting, whatever, that his mind goes into this chaotic state. In a literal sense, what's happening is his adrenaline is raising, and adrenaline is kind of the enemy of, you know, adrenaline is, is what causes a lot of aggression and anxiety and, and destruction and things like that. 
Um, but we just determine a chaos behavior and, and kind of lump all these behaviors into one bucket. So, so like I say, anything that your dog is, you know, when, when your dog is doing something really wrong, you know, that's a chaotic mindset. Now, so what is the opposite of chaos in the natural world? Of course, it's it's control, it's structure, it's calmness. These are two opposing forces. And so, whenever we meet new dogs. Uh, every dog that I've ever met, every person that I've ever met, exists somewhere on this scale, on this spectrum. And they're not always in one spot, they're moving from one place to the other depending on a variety of different things. But every dog exists on this scale. Now this scale, this spectrum, is the foundation, it's the backbone of everything that we do because let's say we split it in half. I would say most of the dogs that I meet for the first time, before I've ever started training, exist somewhere down here you know, somewhere down in that lower half of the spectrum, right? Uh, maybe they're, you know, all the way over here, meaning they're good dogs, but boy, they sure jump on people and bark when somebody rings the doorbell. Uh, they're good dogs, but man, do they tear into the trash when we're gone. They're good dogs, but they pull on the leash. And so they're not doing anything that's like super aggressive or, or you know, hugely anxious or whatever, but, you know, in, in the majority of their life, they're good dogs, but they do all sorts of things that, you know, kind of bug people. Um, and I always find with a dog like this, it's like an 80-20 or 90-10, meaning 80% of the time, 90% of the time, what they do is fine. You know, maybe they're usually not peeing in the house, they're usually not being bad, um, but it's the 10% of the time that causes 90% of the problems. And so I found, and I found dog owners all the time, oh, he's such a good boy, he's such a good boy, but this, this, and this, but he's such a good boy. And that's the reality, most of these dogs are good dogs. You know, they've got a lot of great qualities, um, but it's those little things that add up and really can, I don't want to say ruin somebody's life, but you know, can really affect somebody's life um, uh, you know, for the negative. Now, some dogs are existing even more closer to that end of the spectrum to where you know, something little happens, the doorbell rings and they want to attack. They see a dog and they want to lunge and bark attack. They see a kid, they want to bite or bark or whatever. And so, so in any case, most dogs that I meet for the first time before they've gone through my training exist somewhere down here. Um, where it's either causing enormous headaches or enough headache to where it's like, ah, we got to do something different. Now, uh, if, if we understand this concept, what do we want to do, of course? Well, what we want to do is we want to push the dog further up the scale or the spectrum, right? I mean, it makes sense. We want our dogs existing in a different state of mind such that in that state of mind, they're more prone to being calm than they are to being chaotic. They're more prone to thinking through a problem than just using instinct. They're more prone to... Uh, relaxing than they are to being hyperactive and, and freaking out in excitement or anxiety or whatever. And so we want to move a dog over here. Now, we don't ever want a dog on that complete end of the spectrum, right? You know, that's a robot dog, a dog who's constantly being commanded, a dog who doesn't really even think, you know, he's, all, he's constantly being told. So we don't want to put our thumb over the top of our dogs. But we do want our dogs living right there, for example, to where, you know, there's plenty of times we have fun, you know, sometimes we even dip down here. We have some fun, we play fetch, we wrestle, whatever, you know, but then most of the time the doorbell rings and they're up here. So we're eating dinner and they're up here and just lying down. Um, uh, we're on a walk and they exist up here and they're just calmly walking next to our side. So, you know, 90, 80 to 90% of the time we want the dog living up here to where as new information, new things, new whatever enters their life, doorbells, dogs, veterinary offices, whatever, there's new things into their life, they can handle it because their mind's already in the right place. Now compare this to yourself, you know, compare this to different times in your life, and most people can relate really well. They can talk about points in their life where uh, things were rough and things were tough and things were difficult, and oftentimes their mind was in the wrong spot, and so any new thing was like, oh, it was huge. You know, um, they're in a rough time, their mind's not in the right spot, and they get a flat tire, and it's like this enormous problem. Now, no one likes to have a flat tire, but, you know, let's say you're existing in a different state, right? You know, where you're happy, you're optimistic, you're calm, your mind is in a good place and you get that flat tire. Okay, we'll fix it. You know, and so we exist like this where we're in and out of different states. Our dogs do too. Now, our dogs are never going to live over here unless we show them how. I shouldn't say never. Some dogs, by nature, are more structured and calm. But you probably wouldn't be watching this DVD if that's the case. Most dogs left to their own devices, most people left to their own devices and not taught things about self-control and self-regulation and calmness are going to exist on the wrong side of the spectrum. 
Um, so, so in any case, it's really important uh, to understand this concept. Now, because uh, like I say, you are probably watching this DVD because of behaviors created over here. The aggression, the anxiety, the destruction, the leash walking, the, the disobedience, the not listening, stuff like that. All of that originates from this state of mind. And so you put this DVD in, not realizing exactly what you're going to see, but you put this DVD in wanting to move your dog up the spectrum. So that's what we're going to talk about how to do today. Now, uh, that's what our whole Transform Your Dog in 60 Days program is all about, is about pushing your dog up that spectrum, um, creating this baseline, and then on top of that, building new behaviors and teaching you know, new things and, and getting rid of old things that we don't like so that we've got dogs that are happy and owners that are happy. Now, most of the baseline that we create, here in a second I'm going to go into a little bit more of the training that we do. Most of the baseline that we create is done during weeks one through three. So in our Transform Your Dog in 60 Days program, I'm going to outline, we break it down into weeks, and so it's, you know, nine weeks. Um, I'm going to break down in this DVD what we do in weeks one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, creating this baseline is typically something that's done through weeks one and three. Um, and I want... I want to stress to you guys just how important it is that you create the right baseline because most people, the way that they look at dog training problems is they look and say, I've got aggression, let me attack that. I've got anxiety, let me figure out how I can fix that. I've got leash pulling, let me see how I can fix that. And so they're always looking at you know, the symptoms. Uh, and I often compare it to a disease, not in the literal sense, but uh, you know, if your dog's aggressive or destructive or anxious or hyper or whatever, it's a disease in the sense that there's a root cause and there's a symptom. The symptom is your dog barking at other dogs. The symptom is chewing on your shoes. The symptom is being anxious or whatever. But the root cause is a dog who needs to understand control, structure, calmness. That's the root cause. Most people start approaching things completely backwards. They start saying, okay, let me go after the symptoms. It'd be like if I had pneumonia and I go to the doctor and he says, hey, here's some Here's some aspirin so that your head feels better. Well, that's not a bad thing, right? You know, I do want my head to feel better. I've got pneumonia, my head hurts. But it does nothing to address the underlying root cause. And again, that's where most dog owners start this entire process backwards. They say, I've got to go after these things that are annoying me and causing me problems. And they leave that foundation, they leave that baseline untouched. And so when you go after the symptoms, sometimes you can see temporary relief, much like you could with a disease. But more often than not, what you find is very little tempor temporary relief, and long term you don't get any results. And so that's where we're, you know, we're often second, third, fourth dog trainers that people have called or worked with, you know, because they kept going after symptoms instead of going after the root cause. And so, so like I say, in weeks one through three, if you can do this part right, it sets the entire tone for the next 40 days after that to where you can see a complete transformation. Um, now, I wanted to read a few things before I get into some of the training, uh, just some experiences some of our clients had, because it's real easy for me to get up here and say, um, hey, look, you know, pay attention to the first weeks, one, two, or three. Um, it's a whole different thing when somebody like yourself who's gone through this says it. So just a few things that, that I wanted to read. This was a, an email from a woman named Rachel. Um, she's actually here local to us here in Utah. She says, Ty, oh my goodness, what have you done to my dog? I stopped at PetSmart on the way home to get the supplies you told me to get, and I couldn't believe Zoe. Zoe's her dog. Uh, one of the videos I sent you was me walking Zoe in PetSmart. She's referring to before and after videos. She sent us some videos about walking in PetSmart, and um, you know she's looking all over, sniffing everything, mind off on some party somewhere in her head. One of the videos I passed the dog in PetSmart. She's pulling on the leash, and so she's describing how before we started training. You know, the dog's pulling all over the place, you know, distracted, things like that. Um, this was also a dog that was aggressive in public. Um, today I had her wait at the door before we entered Petco. Actually, I had her wait before getting out of the car. We then walked to the store and had her wait at the door. She did try to come in after the first command, but I gave her a quick check. She was golden in the store. I couldn't believe it. She wasn't trying to sniff everything. She had her eyes on me, focused on me. When we went to check out, a lady came in with two dogs that were in that crazy mode. Big dogs pulling on their leashes. In other words, me and Zoe before today. Zoe looked at the dogs and started to walk towards them, uh, growling a little bit. I don't know if I did the right thing, but I immediately left my cart and started doing the crazy walk to get her attention back on me. 
I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit later about the crazy walk. It's a really powerful technique. It took two seconds and she was back focused on me. Awesomeness. I had a thought on the way home. I think I'm going to buy Zoe a bed for the car too. Anyways, thank you again today. So far, so good. Oh, and the UPS man came. I set her up and opened the door wide open and told her to wait. She did. Yep, very cool. I can't believe the difference in just one day. When the doorbell rang, she gave one bark and that's it. Uh, we'll see how tomorrow goes, uh, but so far, I don't even need chocolate yet to survive. She, she uses chocolate as a coping mechanism. So anyways, this was one day into training, one day into teaching what I'm about to share with you on, on creating the right baseline. Um, that was one case. Um, here's another one that came in from, uh, let me see, this one's from Indiana. We're at the end of week two of, this is on our Facebook page. We're at the end of week two of Transform Your Dog in 60 Days. I'm able to get training in with all three at once. Two are in place command while I work with the third one. Amazing. And she sent us this picture of her three dogs who used to be out of control, all lying down while she watched TV. Um, this next one came in from Portland, who's got our DVD programs. One week ago, this dog could not, and, and she sent actually a video, this is on our Facebook page, um, showing exactly what she's talking about. One week ago, this dog could not hear the sound of my mom's voice be in the same room as my mom, go out on a hike to the beach or anywhere else in public with my mom without being in an extreme state of anxiety. She would scream and attempt to jump on and mouth her. She would also bark at every other stimulus in sight if we were out in the world and my mom was present. As we near the end of our first week of Transform Your Dog in 60 Days DVD program, I decided to put her place command to the test by bringing her down for family game night. She was such a good girl. She whined a little bit and tried to break it a few times at first, but by the end of the first few minutes, she settled down. During the course of the night, there were sausages on the counter. My mom got up and walked around several times. My siblings walked straight past her bed, and my brother even dropped food on the floor. She didn't break it once. I rescued her about a year and a half ago, and this is the first calm interaction she's had with my family. This one will be definitely making it onto our first update video. Um, and so, here she is, a dog she's had for a year and a half, and in one week she's seeing some amazing progress. She actually, um, this one's a long one, she, she gave us a little bit more information. I'm increasingly proud and impressed by the progress you're making every day, and I can't help but to share more. I had to get my wisdom teeth out yesterday, and I wanted to wait until the end of the 60-day challenge, but after my consult with the surgeon, we determined we had to do it, uh, ASAP. We live upstairs, and before we started the program, um, Kavik was often known to try to race me down the stairs when I took her out to go potty. So anyways, it's, it's about a page long, but she goes on to say that she got her wisdom teeth out, she was all drugged up, and her mom was supposed to take the dog out, but in her drugged up stupor, she decided to take the dog out. Now before the training, before this first week, um, her dog would have torn you know, down the stairs, barked at everyone, but that didn't make, you know, that didn't register you know, with her being on the, on the wisdom teeth drugs. Um, and so, you know, she just uh, decided to take the dog out. And she goes on to say, um, uh, you know, how well she did. And she says, uh, for anyone who on, who's on the fence about this program, I have to say it is an investment of time and money, but it's been worth its weight in gold so far. Um, and, and she goes on to talk more about the program and whatnot. Now, am I saying these things to brag about how good we are? Well, on one, one hand, yes. But the reality is, um, I can tell you how important the first one, you know, first weeks one through three are, but if somebody else that's in a position like you can, um, can explain, hey, look, after one week, my dog isn't barking at other dogs, isn't being aggressive, isn't pulling on the leash, is calm in the house. You know, if after one week, you know, these folks can tell you that, it's much more powerful than me just simply saying, hey, do what I'm about to tell you and it's going to work. Um, I recommend you go to our Facebook page and check out what other folks are putting on there. Um, we're seeing some really amazing results. And so the next, the natural question is, hopefully the question in your mind is, all right, I get it, Ty. I want to create this baseline with my dog. How do I do this? My dog is living right here. How do I push my dog up here? Um, I'm going to erase this. So in a simple word, the way that we start pushing our dog up It's through barriers. Now, barriers, uh, when I say barriers, what I'm referring to is putting a barrier in between what your dog wants, uh, or yeah, in front of what your dog wants. Because the biggest problem that dogs have, and the biggest 
you know, what exists on this end of the spectrum, that control, that calmness, what that is is that self-discipline, that self-control. And so the biggest problem that most dogs have is they, they lack self-discipline and their owners have never taught them self-discipline. And so what I mean by that is here's food and the dog just wants to get the food. Here's an open the door, the dog wants to rush out the open door. We put on a leash, the dog wants to rush and pull on the leash. Um, somebody comes in the door, the dog is excited and wants to jump on them. The dog is nervous and wants to be aggressive. The dog, you know, the dog uh, wants to move around, but the owner wants the dog to stay. And so in front of, you know, there's so many things that a dog needs and or wants, uh, and most dogs are used to just doing that. You know, I just want to go get it, I'm going to try to go get it, I just want to go get it. And in the act of doing that, there is no self-control that's created. There's no self-control that's learned. I mean, think about it with, you know, maybe, uh, maybe related to your children or, or to other kids that you know in the neighborhood or kids in general. You know, if we don't teach them barriers, what happens? If we don't teach them that, hey, there's bedtime at a certain time. If we don't teach them that before you do this, you need to brush your teeth. If we don't teach them that before you cross the street, you have to look both ways. You know, if we don't teach them that there's barriers in front of the things that they want, they turn into entitled, entitled little brats, right? Um, and so, and it's the same for us. I want that cool car. Well, there's a barrier in front. I gotta work hard, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. I want to go on vacation. Well, there's a barrier in front of that that I have to overcome. I want to spend some fun time with my kids. Well, there's a barrier, I gotta get this done first, and I gotta make sure the house is clean, whatever. And so the same is true for our dogs. Very few, you know, they want so many things, but very rarely do owners put barriers in front of them. Um, and barrier in this, in this sense is a good thing. You know, when I say barrier, a lot of people immediately are going to bring up in their head, you know, kind of this negative, you know, image of whatever. Um, and, but barrier is a good thing because barriers create uh, discipline and self-control. And again, there's, t there's room for play, there's room for excitement, there's room for plenty of these things. But so many things we need barriers on. And so typically I'm referring to what I would call a resource. So in our Transform Your Dog in 60 Days program, we put barriers in front of resources. Now, um, what I mean by that is, or what I mean by a resource is typically something the dog has to have or wants to have. And so a definite resource would be food. You know, dog has to have that, he has to live. You know, another resource would be attention and affection from the owner. He really wants that, almost has to have that, depending on the dog. Um, and again, things that the dog wants. The dog wants to go out the door. He wants to go on a walk. He wants to go these directions. So what we generally do is we put barriers in front of those things to start teaching a dog how to, um, how to think before acting. And again, that's why you know, those, three, um, those three dog owners that I read you, some of the testimonials, we've got plenty more of those. But those three dog owners, that's why in literally either one day to one week, their dogs are starting to make a big change is because for the first time we're saying, all right, I know you want this, but you can't have it until this. I know you want this, but you can't have it until this. Not to be a jerk, not to be a controlling person, but because our lives are enriched as we learn self-discipline, right? You know, we're so much better off if, if we have control rather than just doing whatever we want, whenever we want. So the, there's, um, there's typically the first few weeks, there's some barriers that we put in front of a few things. Um, the crate the door, walking, and just around the house. And what I mean by around the house, and again, in one DVD, we're not going to have time to go like super in depth on any of these. This is, you know, in our DVD course, it's, it's you know, 10 DVDs, and our, when we work with our local clients, you know, it's hours and hours of training. So what I'm trying to do is give you as, as much as we possibly can. And, in the time that we have to fit on one DVD. But what I'm referring to around the house, a resource for a dog is I want to wander around and sniff this and go over here and do this and do that. And so what we'll teach here is a place command. Go to your bed and stay. So in any case, these four things are what we always start out with for the first few weeks, teaching these concepts. Now, I know what a lot of folks at home who are watching this are thinking because I've heard this before. You know, people say, well, my dog is aggressive at the park. How does this fix it? Um, and what this does, these have what I call a huge collateral effect to where once we start getting the baseline proper and we start getting everything working really great, um, their mind is in the right spot. And so now, 
they have much less desire to be aggressive at the park, or they have much less desire to be aggressive at the veterinarian's office, or at the groomer's office, or whatever, because their mind is right. And so, uh, remember, what we do in the beginning is we go after the root cause, and then we go after the symptoms. And I say that because some people are like, ah, my dog walks okay, he already sits, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, no, we need the dogs to do it at a much higher level, a much better level, because if your dog was already doing these things as well as he or she should, you wouldn't have these problems. You probably wouldn't be watching this DVD. And so, so like I say, we've got to start establishing barriers in front of these resources to begin with. And so, um, so let me talk about how we do that. I'm going to take out this dog and kind of share how we do that. So in the beginning stages, I think he's already wearing one, but we typically have a dog wear a training collar. Now, let me know how far I can get up. Am I good here? Yeah. Okay, so... Right there. I always joke with people that these are about, they look like dungeon torture devices, right? They look awful. These aren't right for every dog, but we use these with a lot of dogs. And the reason we do, um, and they call this a pinch collar, not because it pinches the dog, because it actually doesn't. It, it, you just have to pinch the link to make it go in. The reason I like this is because you look at a harness, a flat collar, a slip collar, things like that, and none of those are necessarily bad. But the problem that you often run into with, with training tools like that is they've got 100% surface area, right? So let's say you've got a harness or just a regular flat collar on your dog, and we're trying to teach leash walking. Well, you know, we put that collar on the dog, and, and the dog pulls, and you're trying to guide the dog with, you know, with some leash communication. Any tug you give or any communication you give with that leash is lessened because it has to travel the whole length of the dog's neck, right? And so that means that if you want the dog to even like know that you're doing anything, you gotta like crank on that leash. Now, I don't like doing that, it doesn't make me feel good, um, but it's also pretty ineffective, it doesn't work. Um, and so, so that's where we often like these collars, even though they look nasty, I, I recommend you head to the pet store and actually feel one. When, when you give a little tiny bit of a correction, it's just tiny little compression, there's, there's um, uh, because there's not all that surface area, I can use way less of a correction and it's way more meaningful for the dog. And so it ends up being a whole lot easier uh, for you to have control over your dog and for you to start seeing some results. Now again, not every one of our clients uses these and so um, I don't want you to think that you absolutely have to, but it's usually what we recommend for most dogs um, just because it makes it easier on the dog, makes it easier on you, and done right it's actually more humane. They did studies with this collar versus other collars, um, and most other collars from a lifetime of use will cause damage, you know, physical damage to the dog's neck or spine or trachea, and these don't. Um, so, do they look awful? Yes, but are they awful? No. Um, and so, now, what we do, um, I'm gonna take this dog out right now, so I have the camera pan over here a little bit. And so, um, what I like to do is I like to make sure that, again, if we're putting barriers in front of the crate, I'm gonna make barriers coming out and barriers going in. I want the dog realizing going out and coming in are calm. We just, you know, we're calm when we do them. And so what I'm gonna do is as I open it, wait, wait. We've already done a little bit of this with him. And so as the door is open, you know, he just stays there. Good boy, good boy. Now, um, Talking about barriers over food or over resources, I didn't list it there, but one overriding thing that we do for typically the first month out of the two month program is uh, we take away the dog's food and he starts working for food. Uh, now again, just for the interest of time, I didn't want to show you everything that we do with the food in this DVD, um, but you know, for example, wait, you know, were he to wait like he did, you know, I'd throw up some food. So for your dog, I would use food. Now, why do I do that? You know, if, if anyone's ever seen some of my videos, they know I'm not a treat trainer. I don't like using treats for training because I think it creates a bad mindset. Um, it creates an entitled dog. It creates a lot of problems. Um, but I use food as a resource often. And so the difference here is, is a treat is like, oh, you did such a good job. Here's an extra little bonus. Whereas food as a resource is, hey, this thing that you need, um, you have to work for it. And so you have to wait here. And then, okay, there's some food and then you have to come out calmly. Okay, and then there's some food. And then you need to sit. Okay, and then there's some food. And so, like I say, uh, we use food as a resource. So we had the four, we had the crate, the door, the walking, and the place command. Those four things are new skills that we use, but the fifth resource that we're controlling in weeks one through three, well actually, like I say, usually weeks one through four, um, is, is that of food. You know, it's where we teach the dog, um, you're working for a living now, you know. 
<laughs> it's not just, oh, it's fun to do this. It's this is this is how you earn your living right now. And so, wait. I use the word wait, you can use whatever word you like. Don't get hung up on words a lot. Okay. Go. And so as he comes out, I'm gonna get him on his leash. Hey buddy. But yeah, don't get hung up on words. But boy, easy, easy. And so I'm gonna use the leash here and kind of guide him so that he's calm. Now he's like, it's okay to be like interested and excited, but I don't want him getting a resource, which is my affection, for free. Or, or even worse, by you know doing something wrong, by like jumping on me or being all wild. I want him to realize that the affection that he's craving, the resource that easy, easy, hey, get your butt over here, there we go, happens you know through calmness. Good boy, good boy. And so going back in, I do the same thing. Come on. Come on. Come on. Sit. Good boy. Okay. Get a Come on. Get a look. Get a look. Now, a lot of dogs are like this in the beginning. I'm glad he's doing this. Good boy. Good boy. You know, they resist going in the crate. You know, if, if they haven't been, uh, and this guy's new to us, so um, he doesn't have a ton of crate experience. And this is a new crate for him anyways. Um, so anyways, I'm glad he's kind of resisting because a lot of dogs will resist and I just kind of want to work them through that. I'm not going to get angry, I'm not going to yell, I'm just going to simply work the dog through that. And so, you know, again, um, this is the point where you would start using food and start helping them understand, yes, going in the crate is a good thing. So same thing, wait. Okay. Good boy. And so he's coming out, but he's not as calm as I want him. So just guide him into position. And position is, I don't care if he's sitting or downing, I just want him calm. Because, I don't know if you've ever done this with your dog, maybe you've seen a dog, where they come out of the crate and they're knocking over the kids and they're bounding all over the place. You know, again, a resource is, I want to go have fun, I want to run around, I'm putting a barrier in front of that. We might go run around later and chase a ball in the backyard. But right now, we're just simply coming out of the crate um, and hanging out. And so, let me try this again. Come on. Hello. Come on, hello. Good boy. No, 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 come on. Come on, come on. There we go. Come on. Good boy. And so, so again, I want to work him through this a few times because I know a lot of your dogs are probably resisting as well. And so what do most people do when the dogs resist? Um, so a resource here is he wants to be out and have my attention. And so I'm putting a barrier in front of that saying, no, now is the time that we're going in a crate. <clears throat> and crates can be wonderfully valuable tools. Once he's in there, he's fine. He, he enjoys it, but he wants to keep having the resource of my attention. And maybe I'm going to the store, so he can't have that resource anymore. Maybe I'm, you know, we're going to sleep or whatever. And so he's got to learn how to be fine in the crate. And so, um, so in any case, we're going to let him out again. Wait. Okay. He comes out, nice and calm. Good boy. Good boy. We'll send him in again. Get up. And you see now that time, oh yeah, so where was I going with that? A lot of folks, the dogs will resist, and so they kind of give up. And so what does the dog realize? Hey, if I want one of my resources and they don't want me to have it, if I fight them a little bit, I get it. And so, you know, a lot of folks will like resist, and so the dog's like, okay, I didn't have to go in the crate in the first place, I just fight him. And so I worked it through two times. Time number three, he goes in a whole lot easier because he realized, okay, this is just the rule that he's, he's giving me. Good boy. Wait. Okay. Let me do it one more time here. Let's see how well he goes in. Good boy. Good boy. So now, in our Transform Your Dog in 60 Days program, um, I generally, for most dogs, recommend a crate. A crate is a wonderful place for a dog to have some downtime, to clear his mind, to think, um, to have real downtime, you know, um, just because your dog takes a nap in the, you know, in, in a ray of sun, doesn't mean he's having downtime. Downtime is where the dog can actually shut off his brain and be calm. I don't know about you, but I need that too. At the end of at the end of a long busy day, after you know being after working with dogs, coming home and hanging out with kids and family, my mind has to have a way to shut down. And if it doesn't, boy, does that stress build. And so like I say, a crate can do that for so many dogs. It can give them this outlet where they can be calm, but a true calm. Like I say, there could sometimes be a difference between a nap and the brain shutting off for a little bit. And so even if your dog, you know, for dogs that are younger like him, uh, you know, I think he's about seven, eight months old, 
Definitely we're going to use a crate because when we're gone or you know, when we can't watch him, he's too young to be having free run around the house. Um, but even as he gets, uh, uh, even as dogs get older, um, like my dogs, for example, they're older, we haven't used crates for years, but I still use them for a while, even after they needed to, just so that they can have that down, that downtime. Now, my dogs were conditioned on how to do that, and so they know how to get their own downtime, and so they'll do it. You know, they'll go shut, they'll go sit in a corner and shut themselves off for a while, and they'll get their own downtime. Um, and so you can work your way away from the crate as time goes on, but especially for dogs with any sort of anxiety or destruction or anything like that, uh, we want to make sure that they're getting real downtime in a crate. So we do it one more time. Come on. Come on. Kennel up. Good boy. So that time a whole lot easier. Um, and so, you know, if I did it five more times, he'd probably just walk right in. Um, but anyways, I want you, starting today and for the next 60 days, using a crate um, as downtime, as a way to supervise your dog so that we're not dealing with destruction or house training issues, things like that. Um, I want you to do that. Now, um, let me, uh, okay, good boy, good boy. What I want to do now is work on a place command. Okay. Um, like I say, most dogs that, uh, that I meet have very little, let's get the camera to pan this way. Um, most dogs that I meet have very little um, structure around the house. You know, the owners, come on, come on. The owners don't insist on them doing a lot, and so what happens is their brain doesn't work very much, and they get into trouble and things like that. And so one thing I've found over the years is that if we anchor the dog's body, the mind tends to anchor as well. So one of the first things that we do in teaching barriers is teach a place command. Now, places go to your bed and stay. A dog doesn't have to do it for 20 hours a day, but if he's doing it during dinner time, during TV time, when somebody comes to the door, you know, we start having control over those things. You know, instead of begging at the table, he's lying in his bed. We just put a barrier in front of that resource. Instead of jumping on your guest, he's lying in his bed. We just put a barrier in front of that resource. The place command is one of the, I sound like a broken record. There's so many things, so many times that I recommend the place command to start teaching the dog calmness around the house. So, um, easy buddy, come on. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna guide him to his bed. Place, he gets on his bed. Now, if he gets off, place, place, I'm just gonna use a little bit of that leash communication to get him back on, good boy. And like I say, you know, if you're using food as a resource, uh, that's a whole other topic, but I'm gonna keep coming back to that a little bit. This is where I give him a little bit of his daily paycheck, right? Good boy, okay, come on. So I told him he could get off, so we're fine. So I'm gonna send him back on, place. So he gets on for free, but as he gets off, place, place. I don't have to, and you'll notice, um, as he gets off, because of the training collar that I'm using, I don't have to use a whole lot of strength. You know, just these tiny little guiding taps. And this is where so many people go wrong with, with you know, the pinch collar or other training collars. Um, come on. Is, uh, come on, come on. Is they think that they're really, you know, harsh or painful on the dog, when in reality, all they are is, is just there for communication. There's just these tiny, tiny little reminders. So I'm gonna have him go back on his bed. Place, good boy. So the place command essentially has two parts. Number one is go to your place, I'm gonna distract him. What's that? What's that? Nope. Place, place, place. So as he got off, just a couple of simple little corrections. Place, good boy. So part one is go to your bed, part two is stay in your bed. And so um, I'm gonna help him on to get him to start. And to get him to stay, you notice I don't say the word stay, it's just that if he gets off, there's just that little bit of leash communication. So in its concept, it's very simple to understand how to do this. It just requires practice, right? Um, and so I always talk about integration training. This is another thing I want you to write down. Integration training is, um, we're all busy. You're probably busy. Um, if you're not, that's great. But most of us are busy. And so getting your dog trained can be a little bit of a challenge because where do you find the time? Well, we integrate our training with what we're already doing. And this, by the way, with his paws off, I'm fine with that. He's not trying to get off, he's just getting comfortable. If he was trying to get off, I'd actually correct that. But anyways, um, so uh, we integrate the training with what we're already doing so that we actually find the time to do it. And so, for example, TV time, dinner time, uh, reading a book time, those are times when I might work on a place command or later on like a down stay. And so if you do that every day, you know, within a week or two, suddenly your dog's staying put. You guys read the, the the testimonial that came in from the woman in 
Portland, um, you know, within week one, she's doing game night with her whole family, food all over the place. She said it took her a few corrections up front and suddenly the dog stayed put. That's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that somebody working hard at this within a week is gonna see some big time results. And so um, what it does though effectively is it teaches the dog the skill set of being calm in the house. And it is a skill. Very few dogs are calm um, because very few people approach it as a skill set. But the reality is it's, it's, you know, the dog has to learn how to be calm. He's not, he, he wasn't, you know, born knowing how to be calm. He has to learn how to do it. So anyways, we've got our crate. We've got it around the house. We've talked about using food as a resource. Um, I want to show you two more things that we do in the first three weeks. Um, again, I know I'm rushing through this, so hopefully you're, you're taking some good notes. Two more things that we do that really set the tone for you know the 60 days. Um, and those things are leash walking and... Um, okay, come on. Leash walking and waiting at the door. So, leash walking is important because as a resource... Um, the dog, we take him outside, he wants to sniff this, he wants to go over there, he wants to pull on the leash, you know, as this guy's pulling on the leash, hey, come on, come on, place, I'm going to send him to his place while I talk for a second. Um, you know, the dog wants to do all sorts of stuff on a walk that we don't want him to do, he wants to be, we want him to be right here, and so we want to start teaching this barrier. Now, we call it the crazy man method, and that was what one of the testimonials referred to, um, is that the dog started to pull a little bit at the pet store, she did the crazy man method, and the dog stopped. And so, in a nutshell, what it is, and I'll show you about you know 30 seconds of it here, um, is we've got the dog on a leash, on a training collar. We tell the dog, come on, or heel, or whatever you like to tell your dog. And we start walking. Now, if our dog's right next to our side, that's great. Um, if our dog starts to pull ahead, instead of pulling back, most people have the tendency to do that, but the problem is dogs have what's called opposition reflex. They oppose tension. So, if I pull him back, it can propel him forward. And so, so like I say, what... Um, Instead of doing that, what we'll do is I'll do a directional change. And so I'm walking, the dog goes ahead, I do a 180. Come on, little, little correction, I go this way. Dog goes left, I go right. Dog goes right, I go left. And so every, do every direction the dog goes that's not right here, I change directions, go a new direction, with just a little bit of a leash communication, a little bit of a correction. And so what the dog starts to experience from this is, man, I go this way, he goes that way, I go left, he goes right, this guy's crazy. Uh, I don't know, what. I better pay attention to him. And so that's why we call it the crazy man method, because you know, it makes the dog thinks you're crazy. Um, the other reason is your neighbors are gonna think you're crazy for a while when you're in the driveway like doing circles and they're gonna think you're back on the sauce or something because you can't walk in a straight line. Um, but anyways, it's our crazy man method and what it does is it teaches focus. It puts a barrier in between, uh, you know, in between what the dog wants and the dog. And so, you know, for example here, let's see how he does, come on. So he goes too far, come on, come on, come on, good boy. So he wants to pull, come on, come on, come on, good boy, good boy, come on. There we go, you see, you know, a few corrections in, suddenly he's paying attention, come on, good boy, and he's happily paying attention, good boy, good boy, come on, good boy, good boy. And so, um, and we've done a little bit of this with him, so it's not like he's a stranger, but you can see, like, right out of the gate, he's like, I'm going to pull. A um, couple corrections, a couple little crazy man turns, and suddenly he's like, oh, I'll pay attention to you. And I want to really highlight something that I love to see. Um, a lot of people worry that, oh, if I correct my dog, you know, he's going to be sad. There's nothing sad about, you know, this dog. You know, when people watch our, our DVD programs, they're amazed that the dogs go from, you know, awful obedience to really great obedience. Um, and... Uh, uh, what was I yeah, I mean, they're amazed that the dog can do that and still remain happy. And so what's really important here is that, uh, you know, we're not doing these huge corrections with the dog, that the leash and the training collar are simply there for guidance. So let me do a tiny bit more. Let me see how he does. Come on. Good boy. So if he goes too far. Good boy. Come on. Good boy. There we go. Come on. Good boy. Come on, come on, good boy. So lots of these directional changes really create, you know, the ability for the dog to pay attention. Um, and so there's one more thing that I wanted to show you, and so we're actually going to flip the camera around. I want to show you to teach the dog to wait at the door. So hang right with us.
Okay, so we're going to teach this, you know, work with this dog. I'm waiting at the door. Come on. Watch out. Um, and so, uh, and pardon the lighting. I know the lighting is not great here. We've got a wonderful spring day here in Utah. And so, um, but what I'm going to do here is as I open the door, I'm going to give them a free command. Now, this is something that we teach a lot to our clients, the concept of having a free command. Now, when I say free, what I mean is there's no correction, there's no food, there's no reward, there's no anything. I just say the word. Now, I'm going to say the word wait. Now, if he waits, that's great. If he doesn't wait, I'm just going to use a little bit of uh, leash communication. So, wait. Good boy. Good boy. So, you see how I kind of leave my hand ready? Because in case he started to come out. Wait. Wait. Good boy. Good boy. Wait. And I'll even do things like that. Just kind of trick him. Now, the reason why... I'm going to come back over here where the light's better. Um, but the reason why uh, we do a lot of waiting at the door is there's functionality to it, but again, there's also this barrier that really teaches the dog how to be calm, how to relax, um, that the door open is not your invitation to leave. So many dogs, they see that door open, and they're like, I gotta get out. You know, a kid opens the door, the dog rushes out, or whatever. And so we want to be teaching the dog, you know, just about calmness, about just going through the door calmly. And so... Um, we're going to switch the, uh, the camera back over here, and then I'm going to show you what we start doing weeks three through six. Okay, so like I said, weeks one through three is all about using leash training. In fact, what I'm going to recommend to you, and what we recommend in our DVD program and in our local clients, is for that first month, three to four weeks typically, out of the 60 days, we keep a leash on the dog at all times. Not in the crate, but you know, whenever you're with the dog, in the yard, at home, that we've got a leash on the dog so that we can... Um, Control things. That's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is people are constantly in the habit of giving commands to their dog and they have no way to back it up. So they say sit and the dog doesn't sit and they have no way of doing it. You know, no way of making sure the dog does. They tell the dog to come, they tell the dog to stay, whatever, but they're trying to train verbally. But the problem is dogs don't learn very well verbally. They learn better physically. And so with a leash on, I can communicate what I want, have them wait, have them place, have them do all these things. And so, so in any case, in the beginning stages of training, uh, for the first few weeks, I want you to keep a leash on your dog um, so that you can control the outcome of what goes on with your dog. Now, um, and I always tell people, it's a pain in the butt, you know. Uh, in fact, I always tell people before they start transforming your dog in 60 days, the next 60 days are going to be a lot of hard work. Sometimes you're going to be annoyed, sometimes you're going to lose sleep, but if you can put in 60 days of the work that I'm going to show you, you're going to have some amazing results. So anyways, um, but we've got to move towards off-leash training with our dogs because I can't leave a leash on them forever. Um, and so there's really two ways to do this. You know, back when I first got started training in 1994, um, we would train off-leash dogs all the time. And we would do it with, you know, regular leash, and we'd use a long leash, and, um, you know, we would use uh, short leashes and things like that. And so we would, like, kind of gradually move away from, uh, you know, move away from being on the leash. And that's still a fine way to train. Um, we, you know, back then we got a ton of dogs trained to an off-leash level, to a really great level, so it's a wonderful way to train. Um, the problem is, is it's a, lot of, it's a lot more work than a lot of people are willing to do, and it's very difficult work, um, and uh, it takes too long, oftentimes. And so, what we teach in Transform Your Dog in 60 Days is how to use a remote training collar. Now, um, there's a lot of negative stigma on these out here. Now, some people watching this are going to be like, yeah, I understand those. I'm cool with those. There's going to be some people watching that are like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe you'd ever use that on a dog. Um, and people will say that up until I show them exactly how it works and how to use it. Because the reality is this is probably, you know, done right. This is some of the most humane training that you could ever do. We use it only on low levels, and it's a teaching tool. Um, and it's a tool for showing, and it's a tool for teaching. It's not a tool for punishment or anything like that. And so it ends up being a very easy way to train the dog. In fact, we always have people feel it. You know, I'm clicking it right now. We always have people feel it, and most people um, can't feel it. You know, on the levels that we use, it's so low that people can't feel it. Now, the dog, all we're looking for is just like a slight recognition. You know, just he barely feels it. We're not looking for any pain or any like big shock that people think comes from these. We're looking for the dog to just kind of barely feel it. And so, um, we use this to trans, uh, to, well, to transform your dog, but we use this to transition from having a leash trained dog to an off-leash trained dog. And so once, you know, in our Transform Your Dog in 60 Days program, 
The first three weeks, you know, we're using that leash training, teaching the dog all these skills on the leash. And then from there, we start using the e-collar to train it off. Now, um, if, uh, if you don't like the e-collar and you just absolutely cannot use it, um, there, you know, in, in the DVD program with our local clients, we do teach some workarounds. We teach how you can do it without it. I do recommend it. You know, it just, it's a better way to train. It's a more humane way to train when it's done right. It's an easier way to train. Um, but anyways, this is a great tool when it's used properly. And so um, uh, what, I, what we use it for is we use it for, like I say, all the obedience we want. We want the dog healing off leash, coming when called off leash, all these wonderful things. And so I want to show you how we use it because, again, there's a lot of misconceptions about how people do this. And done right, it's very humane. Wait. Okay. So I'm going to get it fit. Hey, buddy. Oh, what a boy. Okay. So we're going to get it fit, and we always go to a low level. Now, um, oftentimes the way that I teach people how to, te you know, to get their dog to come and call, for example, the best way to explain it is to explain what people do wrong and why these get a bad name. Because these deservedly have a bad name. You know, they do, done wrong, they do some bad things. And so um, what I mean by that is a lot of folks say, my dog doesn't come when called. Now, they're not treating it from baseline level. They're not going for you know, the right foundation, the right baseline. They're just like, let me go after the symptom. He doesn't come uncalled. Let me strap one of these collars on him. And so here's what happens. They're in the backyard. They strap the collar on. Place. Place. They strap the collar on. The dog doesn't come. So they're like, all right, now you're going to come. And they hit the button. The dog still doesn't come. They hit the button. They're like, this isn't working. And they up the level. And now the dog's like screaming and having an awful time. Um, and so this is one of the ways that dogs that these get a bad name is because people don't teach with them They punish with them and so what we do is we take time and teach with it So what we do is we go to a very low level um, In fact, let me show you Come on. Very low level. I'm gonna go really low here and I hold down the button Come here. And the second the dog starts to come I release the button, but I'm using a leash at the same time So I hold it down Come here. good boy you see that? He just kind of like flicked his head. It was just a little bit itchy. There's no pain involved. Um, and so what happens is I hold it down. I guide the dog to me. He starts to come. I release the button. I hold it down. I guide the dog to me. He comes. I release the button. So in his mind, after enough repetition, he starts to realize, okay, every time I come, that little tickle shuts off. So one, two, come here. Good boy. Good boy. And so the dog starts to realize, okay, that's what, you know, that's what come means or that's what here means or whatever. So what does that translate to later? Later, we take the dog off the leash um, and we tell the dog to come. And in his mind, he's like, ha ha, there's no leash, I don't have to come. Um, and at that point, we can still use a very low level stimulation. And he's like, oh, I know what that means. And here he comes. So in fact, I hold it down, come here, come here, good boy. So the second he started to come is when I released that button. Good boy. So in concept, you know, this can become a fairly simple, you know, it's a very simple concept to understand. Come here, bud. Um, the thing is it needs a lot of practice and what you have to be doing is you have to be teaching with the leash and the e-collar. In fact, it's the same thing with the place command. So for example, place, good boy. So he goes to his bed. If he was to get off, let's say I just hit the button. Um, is he going to jump on his bed? Of course not. Place, place. Because he's just feeling this tiny little tickle. What about tickle means come? What about tickle means go to your bed? Nothing does, of course. And so that's where I always tell people this is very non-compelling. It's just a little tickle. Whereas the leash is very compelling. You know, as I, as I um, use the leash and kind of guide him to his bed or guide him to me, it's very obvious what I want. And so as I combine the two, non-compelling with compelling, it gives meaning to this tiny little tickle. And so we're actually able to train the dog to a very high level of obedience with a very low level that's not painful, not conflicting, just this tiny little tickle, this itchy little thing. So come on. So for example, he did it once, he got off, place, so I get him on, now if he gets off, place, I hold it down, place, good boy, hold it down and I guide him back with the leash, the second he gets back on his bed, I release the button. And so as we do this during weeks um, three through six, you know, starting about week four, week five, we stop using the leash and we're just using the e-collar. 
and we get to the point to where uh, we're healing off leash. You know, within 60 days, we've got a dog that you can take up on a trail off leash. We've got a dog that you can heal with in your neighborhood off leash. We've got a dog that off leash we can send him to his bed when somebody rings the doorbell instead of him jumping all over them. But like I say, uh, it, it puts us in a position when we do it right to where um, we can very quickly get this great level of obedience. Um, I want to talk about weeks 7, 8, and 9, and then I'll finish up here. And again, I hope you're getting a lot out of this. And I know I'm rushing through a lot of it just because of, you know, this is just one DVD. But if you're picking apart the little gems and you're picking apart the little, you know, the diamonds in the rough here, you're finding, oh, I could do that better with my dog. Oh, I could do that better with my dog. Oh, I could do this or I could do that. And so uh, what we find is that, you know, very quickly you can see some big changes if we do things right. So typically in our Transform Your Dog in 60 Days program, week seven is where we do um, a field trip. Um, because at that point, you know, maybe you're doing it at your house or whatever. It's important that our dogs are obedient everywhere. And so field trip can be a veterinary office, pet store, um, Home Depot, uh, you know, just somewhere where there's going to be a lot, a lot of distractions. Because if we've set our baseline the correct way, adding new distractions shouldn't be terribly difficult. And I point that out because this is something I get all the time. People will come to, you know, come to our company and they'll say, oh, my dog's awful when we take him to the park, or he's awful when we do this. They haven't even set a foundation, and then they completely raise the ante and have tons of distractions and they want the dog to be obedient, it's not going to happen. We have to have that foundation. So that's where, like I said, the first six weeks, you know, we're teaching, we're getting the off leash, we're teaching the dog how to do it with distract, you know, and then we, week seven is all about adding the distractions. Now, one of the main things that, that we teach in week seven is all about what we call priming the pump. Um, and this is something that I want you to do with your dog, whether you go to the pet store tomorrow or you get to week seven or whatever. Um, the way that the dog starts an interaction with anything typically uh, is, is how that interaction is going to go. So if your dog enters the pet store wild and excited, that's how your interaction with the pet store is going to go. If your dog enters the vet's office freaked out and anxious, that's how it's going to go. And so what I like to do is prime the pump, meaning the first two or three minutes before we enter any new thing, park, vet, pet store, Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, is we get the dog's mind in, in the right spot. And so really all it is, come on, is um, it's two, three minutes of very intense, very quick obedience to where it's, uh, you know, I'll walk the dog, come on, sit, 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 good boy. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Sit, sit, come on, sit, sit, down, good boy, come on, come on. And I'm doing a lot of like hands-on obedience, come on, place. Um, hands on where I've got the leash, sit, good boy. Uh, you know, I've got the leash and I'm, and I'm guiding him through it. But in doing that, in doing those two to three minutes of very like intense and quick obedience, it requires a great deal of focus from the dog. And when we get that level of focus from the dog, what we see is the dog is really tuned in. So I do that for two or three minutes outside the store. Suddenly I go in the store, I've controlled that, that first part and now our dog, it, it's, it's, is much like you know it's much more likely it's going to be a great interaction um, and so you know same thing in the vet's office or whatever um, so that's week seven where we you know we we start testing out the real world and i recommend that you start doing that once you get to week seven as well now week eight is usually where we really start saying okay you've got all of these things together um, how do we make sure that the dog is great at the house now, if you've been doing these things well, typically the only thing during week eight that we need to customize is doorbell manners. Now, um, you know, because your dog should be calm around the house doing place command, but for a lot of dogs, they still might be struggling a little bit with doorbell manners. And so what we'll do in week eight is we just practice that. You know, it's, um, and what I always call it is bite-sized chunks. You know, we need the dog, um, we know what we want the dog to do when the doorbell rings, we need to break it down into bite-sized chunks. So, for example, when your doorbell rings, where's your dog? I ask that to 100 people, 99 people will say the dog's up here barking. So what's the first bite-sized chunk? He's got to leave there, so I'm going to call him away. Now that's something that we worked on week two, week three, week four, is how to call him away. Um, and then what's the next bite-sized chunk? He's got to go to his bed or he's got to go lie down. And so we work on that, you know, have him go to his bed. And what's the third bite-sized chunk? He's got to stay there. So, you know, we practice him staying when we walk towards the door. Um, and so you've got to break it down into little chunks because what happens is that's how a dog's mind works. You know, we as people, we see the big picture much easier. 
So in our mind, you know, I want the dog to show up and go lay down over there or something. You know, and, and so we've got it in our mind what we want, but the dog's mind, we've got to break it down to what does that actually look like? First, it looks like coming away from the door, then it looks like going to your bed, then it looks like staying put. And we can work on each one of those three little bite-sized chunks, you know, individually. And then I find, you know, usually 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 times of doing that, and now our dog's perfect at the door. And so what you'll want to do is to get that 63 repetitions that you need, um, have your kids ring the doorbell, have your next door neighbor, spouse, whatever, you know, start getting in fake or manufactured repetitions where, you know, the dog is, uh, you know, where we're ringing the doorbell just for the sake of working on it. Uh, and then week nine, what we always do is we wrap it up, you know, where we just look at everything and say, all right, are there any weaknesses left? What do we need to do to, to fix that? So, um, in summary here, you know, I've, I've thrown down a ton of information. I've thrown down 60 days worth of information in the space of, you know, around an hour. Um, like I said, I hope uh, that you were taking notes. I hope that you were realizing what you could do with your dog. More importantly, though, like I said, I've outlined, you know, week one we do this, week, you know, one through three we do this, three through six we do this, seven we do this, eight we do this, nine we do this. So I've outlined what you should be doing. Um, if you do it, we have not had a dog yet who doesn't see a complete transformation, you know, who doesn't see just enormous leaps forward in their obedience, in their behavior, in their everyday life, in the satisfaction that the owners get from the dog and things like that. And so, so again, I know I, it's the end here and I'm sounding a little bit hypey, but really what I want to do is push you to act. Um, because now that you have this information, it does you nothing if you do nothing with the information. And that's unfortunately what a lot of people do is you know they get information and they sit on it they get information i'll start this another time and they don't so uh, get out there act on it if you need more help i'm going to go ahead and put those links down below again if you need more help contact us you know we've got programs here in utah that we can help you with we've got people that come in from out of state so that we can work with them um, we've got programs where you can use our dvds you know the entire line of dvds things like that Go down below, make sure you're clicking on those links if you need a little bit of extra help. Um, if you don't, I think that's awesome. Um, if you can get some great stuff you know, from, uh, from this DVD and start moving forward, I encourage you to do that. We'd love to see you as our next testimonial, as our next case study for a dog that has been able to turn around completely. So thank you so much for spending the, the last little bit with me. I hope I've been able to help you out a lot and time for you guys to get to training. <laughs>